For those of you who I haven't seen before, my name is Maxine Hunter and I'm the residential horticulture agent in Marion County. Um, if you haven't been to our offices before, we are located right next to the Southeastern Livestock Pavilion. So we're north on 441. Oop, didn't mean to do that. Um, we've got a very nice facility that unfortunately right now is not open to the public. However, we will uh, be back open as soon as we get through with this pandemic. And um, we look forward to seeing all of your friendly faces. So um, one of my very favorite things to talk about is wildlife. Um, I am a wildlife major from the University of Florida and we get a lot of really positive feedback on um, some of the wildlife displays that we do and some of the wildlife talks that we do across the county. So today we're here to talk about venomous and non-venomous snakes of the southeast. Um, we'll talk about how to stay safe around um, if you encounter a snake at your home and uh, what you can do and how to identify them. Also, if you ever have a snake around, please feel free to take pictures and send me pictures if you need help identifying it. I will tell you this is not an all-inclusive list of snakes in Florida. We have many, many, many species and one of the cool ones that I didn't add to this presentation, uh, but they just came out, they hadn't seen it in a number of years, was the rainbow snake found in the um, Ocala National Forest. So snakes are pretty cool. They're not a bad thing. They do help us with our ecosystem. They help um, manage pest problems such as mice and rats um, and they can be very beneficial. So don't grab the shovel the first time you see a snake and um, we've had really good luck with um, presenting this across the county and having people call us afterwards and say, hey, you know, I had a snake come across my driveway this morning or found one in my carport and you know, what is it and is it dangerous? And, you know, we help them identify it and we go on and the snake's happy, the people are happy and we really enjoy seeing our wildlife continue. So with that, let's get going on this. Oh, my computer here is moving faster than I want it to. All right, try that again, sorry. So there are at least 45 species of native snakes in Florida. A few of these include the Eastern garter snake, our Eastern hognose snake, the corn snake and the pine wood snake. Um, I will tell you that the corn snake here on the left hand side that blends in very well with this pine tree is our number one offender for being close to people's homes and for people calling us wanting an identification and they are completely harmless. So take a good look at that and we'll talk more about these as we go. Um, as I mentioned earlier, snakes play a very important role in our ecosystem. You can see here in this photo, we have a non-venomous brown water snake eating fish. We've got a red-shouldered hawk that has preyed upon a snake. And then we've got a non-venomous black racer eating a leopard frog. So all of these are good snakes that are doing their part. Come on, computer. Sorry, guys, I'm, my fingers aren't working this morning. Okay. So let's talk about some of the harmless and non-venomous snakes. Um, of the 45 species and snakes here in Florida, we have six that are venomous um, and should be of concern to you. However, uh, we'll talk more about that as we go. Even because they're venomous doesn't mean they should be a danger to you. So um, in this picture, we've got six species of non-venomous snakes that we're going to go through individually. These are commonly seen in our ecosystems. So the first one is our rat snake, also called a corn snake or chicken snake. There are multiple different species that fall into this category. On the top left, we have the red rat snake. So this is a native snake that's very good, commonly seen. We see it in a variety of different colors. It can be gray, yellow, um, but there are several different actual species amongst them. So, but they all gr grouped into the category of red rat snake or corn snake. In the middle, we have what I grew up calling a chicken snake, which is also called the yellow rat snake. And then on the right, you can see there's a gray rat snake. Many of you have probably seen some of these before. Um, there's a lot of variations in color, but this is their general pattern. Also, if you flip them upside down on their belly, not that I want you to handle them by any means, just general info. Um, they have a black and white checkered um, pattern on their belly. So, um, these are good snakes. They're really good to have around and they love to help you out with any kind of um, rodent problems that might be around, but they'll also feed on small lizards and frogs. 
Um, we have quite a few of these around my place here, just north of Ocala. And I have come out and found them in our barns, um, found them in a feed bucket one day, a rather large one, about four foot long, and uh, about gave me a heart attack, but just wasn't expecting to see them. But um, we live quite cohesively with them. All right, next we have our pinewood snake. This looks very similar to our rat snake. However, it is very characteristic for pine tree and upland areas with pines. It blends almost perfectly into a pine tree. I've seen them climbing up pine trees. I've only seen two of these in the wild in my time, and I've spent quite a bit of time out there. But they blend in so well, you can often not see them. Um, their belly, unlike the red rat snake or corn snake, is a whitish yellow color rather than the black and white checkered. So, um, and then you can see the juvenile is a similar color to the adult, but doesn't have quite as much of a red probably to help them blend in a little bit more. So these guys will go up to the very tip tops of pine trees and um, I've seen them coming up and down in uh, flatwoods areas, so. Next, we have another one that we get a lot of calls on, our Eastern Indigo Snake. This guy gets rather large. He has almost an iridescent uh, color to him when the sun hits him. They're beautiful um, with few, almost blue highlights and their chin and throat is a red or white color. They may actually flare up if they feel threatened and kind of look like a cobra, but it is all an act. There is no um, danger with these snakes. In fact, these are one of the best snakes that you have around because they can um, actually feed on some of our venomous snakes. So these guys are really good in our ecosystem and to have around your home. I also like to tell people these particular snakes are very territorial. So when you have an Eastern Indigo, um, it is your snake. So don't be fearful of them. Realize that they're doing a good job in your landscape. So they often like to hide in uh, large grasses and shrubs. All right, another one that we have that is a native non-venomous snake is our rough green snake and our Florida rough green snake. Um, I have not seen these guys since I was a kid. We used to catch these in our hay pastures, our hay fields, but um, these guys have very much keeled scales. Um, they're very rough to the feel as their name suggests, but they're very skinny, thin, um, vine-like snakes, um, usually found in grassy areas, in palms, um, but another really good snake to have around. These guys primarily feed on frogs and lizards, so they're not, not a large snake at all. So one of the things that we have to be concerned about, we've talked a little bit about the fact that snakes play a large role in our ecosystem, but there are some threats to snakes out there. Believe it or not, snakes are good. I know many people are fearful of them, and that's something we talk a lot about in our in-person classes, um, but there are a lot of threats to snakes that we would like to try to prevent. One of the biggest that we see in Marion County is habitat loss. So I actually had a call several months ago from a client who had a coral snake coming up into their driveway and they asked why it would be there. And I talked to them about the fact that there might be building and construction going on around them. And they said, oh, as a matter of fact, there's a house being built just three doors down from us. So this uh, coral snake's habitat probably got destroyed in the construction process and it was looking for a new home. I will tell you that that snake did not stick around. It was not looking to make a home in their home. Um, generally speaking, they like the pinewood areas, grassy areas, um, and they're burrowers. So they prefer to stay somewhere where they've got a mulch or a pine straw bedding to dig under and will usually stay near the roots of trees. So, but habitat loss is the number one threat to wildlife worldwide, as well as to wildlife here locally. So um, it's nice that we can try to landscape and provide some cover for wildlife, including even venomous snakes. And we'll talk more about staying safe with that as we go on. Secondly, road mortality. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I've been driving down the road, especially in early summer months when the snakes are starting to get af active after the winter and you see people actually swerve to hit the snakes. So rather than trying to swerve to miss them or letting them cross without any mortality issues, they actually will swerve to try to hit the snakes. And that's just 
not my personal preference. But um, the third thing is persecution through programs such as the Rattlesnake Roundup. Thankfully, we don't have anything like this here in Florida. Rattlesnakes here in Florida are actually threatened and endangered. Um, there are programs to save the rattlesnakes here, um, but out west, that's not the case. In fact, one of these rattlesnake roundups just happened a couple weeks ago. So I believe that one was actually in Texas. But let's try to protect our snakes and learn about them so we understand more about them rather than being fearful. So we mentioned earlier there's 45 snakes um, species that are native here to Florida. Uh, we're not talking about the invasive, just the natives. Um, we have only six of those, 45, are venomous species. And of those six, only four are commonly found here in Central and South Florida. So we're going to go through each of these carefully, but they are the copperhead, the cottonmouth, the coral snake, the diamondback rattlesnake, the pygmy rattlesnake, and the timber rattlesnake. The copperhead and the timber rattlesnake are not often found here this far north. Or I'm sorry, this far south. They're usually both more northern species. So we don't have a lot to worry about with those. However, I have seen um, two copperheads down here uh, just north of Marion County. I have not seen a timber rattlesnake um, south of Jacksonville. So I know they can be... Um, in the northern part of the state, but they're not commonly found. So that leaves us with four, the cottonmouth, the coral snake, and the diamondback rattlesnake, and the pygmy rattlesnake. The interesting thing about this is the coral snake is the least aggressive of all these. In fact, it's a very docile animal that really doesn't want to bother much of anybody. And I talked to the Lake County Venom Unit um, with Fire and Rescue last year, and they said the number one bite they have is from coral snakes. And the reason being, not because the coral snake is more dangerous than the others, but it is oftentimes thought of, because of its docile nature, that it can be taunted or played with. So one of the stories that caught my attention from this fire rescue unit was a gentleman that had actually picked up the coral snake, taken it into his house, and he had played with it for two and a half hours prior to getting bit by it. So um, coral snakes are also rear fanged. So they kind of have to chew on you. It's not a strike like the other three. So um, it's very interesting that that's the most problematic species here in Central Florida. Um, we try to encourage people to stay away from these venomous animals and give them their space and respect them rather than trying to play with them or trying to kill them. I will, try to, I will tell you also the very most common way to get bit by one of these snakes is to try to kill it because oftentimes if you miss and they feel threatened they're going to strike whereas if you leave them alone they will scurry on about their way so characteristics of venomous pit vipers such as our eastern diamondback or cottonmouth um, and our pygmy rattlesnake they have a thick blocky head with an obvious neck some people often refer to it like a triangle whereas your uh, non-venomous snakes will have a very uniform head and neck, there's no separation in size. They're often thick bodied for their length. They have a relatively short tail. They have heat sensitive pit vipers on their face. Um, they have complete scales on the underside of their tail. So if you see here in the picture in the bottom, you can see that the one on the left has a vent with complete scales and the one on the right is divided. The one on the left is the venomous, the one on the right is the non-venomous. Um, they're often keeled scales, which means that they're extremely rough. They have a dark facial band from the corner of their eye to their jaw, and they have elliptical pupils versus round pupils. So um, these are all characteristics that you can look out for, but I will tell you the number one thing to know about all of these signs and characteristics if you're looking this closely, you're probably already too close. So um, please don't try to confirm any of this with the snakes as you encounter them. Stay back, at least six foot back from them. Take a picture. You can zoom in with a camera on your picture um, or camera on your phone, and we can try to help you identify it. Again, please don't try to get close enough to look at the keeled scales or the vent or the eyes. Um, just take a picture of it from a distance and let it go on about its way. 
I will also tell you that from these characteristics, I have seen a ball python with elliptical pupils, and I have seen a venomous water moccasin with round pupils. So these are not always 100% accurate. There's always going to be oddities in the world that don't match up. Um, our first one that we're going to talk about is the cottonmouth or water moccasin. On the left hand side, you can see we have an adult cottonmouth. They get their name because they often open their mouth as part of their warning. And it's a bright white, you can't really miss it. On the right hand side, we have a juvenile cottonmouth that looks quite a bit different. It's much lighter colored and, um, and um, you can see that it hasn't developed that dark brown muddy color yet, but it does have the thick blocky head you can see the eye band on the juvenile animal much better than you can see it on the adult. And um, it's gonna continue to get larger. One of the biggest characteristics about the cottonmouth is their width. As you get an adult cottonmouth, they are very, very fat animals. They're short, stubby. Usually you don't see them longer than about three, three and a half feet, and they're extremely thick for their size. They are found throughout the entire state of Florida and they are very common on some of our golf course and HOA areas. So keep an eye out for this guy. You will not likely see them unless they are um, near water sources or in times of drought where they're out searching for water. So um, keep an eye out for them. I will tell you I have encountered cotton mouse when I've been doing field work. Very, very up close and personal. Um, I encountered a large adult that was less than 18 inches from me and it was coiled up ready to strike. I stood still and I gave it some time and it went on about its way. So generally speaking, the only time these animals want to bother you is when they're threatened. The cottonmouth is one of the most aggressive species out there though. So if you try to poke it with a stick or get it to go on, it is likely to come towards you. So definitely don't harass these animals. The other unfortunate part about um, cotton mouse is there are many non-venomous water snakes that are not moccasins that offer suffer very uh, ill fates because they look so much like the cotton mouth. Remember that that is part of a natural defense system to look like a venomous animal. So on the top left, you can see these are pictures of banded water snakes. They're also very thick, but they are not as thick as the water moccasin. They are very, very similar in um, color in size to the water moccasin, and they actually have a defense mechanism to warn off predators by lifting their chin, and their under part of their chin is white like the cotton mouse is, and so oftentimes you can't really tell the difference very easily. So people will often kill these banded water snakes when they're completely harmless. A couple others that we have that also look similar, however, they're not uh, as similar as the, to the water moccasin as the banded water snakes are. We've got the brown water snake and the Florida green water snake. And again, these guys are completely harmless and they are often persecuted as moccasins. Best case scenario is just leave them alone and look from a distance. All right, next, you see the copperhead here. Um, copperhead is one that has hit the news here in recent years with people getting bit at restaurants where the snake has been in cover that is strictly because of loss of habitat and those snakes have found cover in shrubs but if you look at the map on the bottom right hand corner they really don't come into our area so we're not going to spend a lot of time on them. I will say I have seen a copperhead. I've seen two of them um, in Alachua County but I have not seen any in Marion County so their distribution comes farther north than this map shows. Um, they're actually a very beautiful snake uh, as their name suggests, they're a real bright coppery color. Um, they blend in well to mulch and leaves, so, but they're not one you should really have to worry about in Marion County at all. So um, they prefer wooded areas. None of these snakes prefer to be in habitats that are shared with you. The only time you're going to see them in shared habitats is when there's not anywhere else for them to be. Next, we have our Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake. This guy also gets a lot of press. Um, usually he is found in urban areas in large uh, size. 
Um, he can get six foot plus in size. And so obviously these guys get really big. Um, there is a rattlesnake foundation here in Florida that's based out of Jacksonville that focuses on trying to preserve this species because these guys are threatened and endangered. Um, beautiful animals. Generally speaking, they don't want to bother you, but they will not tolerate being harassed. And they're very dangerous if they are harassed. They can strike at least half of their body length. So if you've got a six foot snake, it can strike an average of three to three and a half foot. Um, at, that's at a minimum. So keep your distance from them. Um, if you have a smaller snake, obviously it's uh, going to be less likely to get you from a distance, but you really want to back away slowly when you see these animals. Leave them alone and they will try to warn you that's what the rattles are for. Um, people often off, also talk about the fact that their rattles, um, they produce one rattle each year. Um, so sometimes that'll give you the age of it. However, obviously they're not counting those rattles until the snake is dead. But the larger the snake, generally, unless something has happened and a predator has torn off the rattles, you can get a pretty good warning sign from them. They make a pretty significant noise trying to get you to back away. They don't have any interest in biting you. None of these animals um, think of humans as a prey for them. The only reason they would bite you is if you are threatening them. Obviously, sometimes that's going to happen if you just encounter them walking or something if you're taking a trail, so if you are out hiking, uh, please be aware of where you walk. If it's closer to your home, you just want to make sure that if you're out in the garden area and you're concerned about snakes, you make a lot of noise. So, and I don't mean out there hooting and hollering or anything like that, but if you take a shovel or rake and you kind of shake the shrubs prior to starting to work in them, you're much less likely to encounter a snake. Remember the fact that snakes feel vibration so that's what they're looking for. They're looking for that vibration and they know that you're bigger than a prey to them and they just want to get away from you. Next we have the timber rattlesnake. This is another protected species, a very different pattern than the eastern diamondback. Um, another one that gets very large. However, this guy does not generally come our way. So their distribution is just slightly north of us and I have not seen a timber rattler in years, but I also have not seen one north of the Jacksonville airport. I'm sorry, south of the Jacksonville airport. So um, this is a species that we really don't see in South Florida or Central Florida at all. And um, their numbers have declined substantially. So we're really not gonna go into this guy today. If you have any other questions on it later, I'll be happy to answer them though. Okay, this is one of my worst fears here is the pygmy rattlesnake. The pygmy rattlesnake is small. It's got a coppery color on top of it and otherwise is a dark gray and it blends in very well into our sandhill habitats and our oak leaves and other mulched areas. He means no harm, but he does have a powerful punch and he's small. So although he has rattles like the diamondback rattlesnake, he doesn't make nearly as much noise to warn us to back away. So um, they are found throughout the state. They can be aggressive, but generally speaking, as long as you leave them alone, they'll go on about your way. This snake is much, much smaller than the diamondback. It only gets to be about 18 to 24 inches. Um, anything over 24 inches would be a very, very mature adult pygmy. So, but on average, we see them about 18 to 24 inches. They could possibly get up to as long as about 32 inches, but that would be really pushing it. I've never seen one that big. All right, the next species that we have is our coral snake. Remember the old saying, red touches yellow, you're a dead fellow. Um, there is some truth to that. That's a great way to remember it. Um, but overall, this species is extremely docile and does not want to be messed with. They usually, as you can see in the picture on the right, the snake is burrowing into a um, leaf litter, pine straw mix. That is generally the habitat they like. Um, and even though they're very brightly colored, you often won't even notice them. So um, these guys are pretty common in our state. Um, they are a good species. They do feed on... Uh, small rodents and um, mostly frogs and lizards, 
but they're a great snake to have around and uh, just be careful if you have kids or pets that might taunt them. Make sure they know to be on the lookout for those red and yellow colors. Much like the water moccasin, uh, coral snakes have multiple non-venomous lookalikes. So if you see yellow and red touching, stop. That's a venomous coral snake. There are scarlet king snakes and a scarlet snake as well as a milk snake that look much like the coral snake. The colors are the same. Again, remember that in wildlife, this is a natural response. So uh, we generally try to keep that um, going because they think that their colors mimicking that coral snake gives them protection from predators. So you can see the scarlet king snake is almost the exact same colors as the venomous coral snake, but it's in a different pattern. So the yellow touches the black and not the red. Same thing with the scarlet snake and the milk snake. So are there safety issues that you really need to be concerned about? The number of venomous snake bites that we have in the state of Florida are very minimal. Um, you can reduce your chances of being bitten by a venomous snake by number one, watching where you're walking and leaving them alone. If someone gets bit by a venomous snake, please call 911 and get them away from the animal. Um, don't try to catch the animal, don't try to kill the animal. Uh, the venom unit will be able to figure that out. The chances of being bitten by a venomous snake are extremely low. There are a total of seven to 8,000 bites each year in the US. Most of those happen in the southwestern US. So Texas, Arizona, Kansas, New Mexico. Um, fatalities are extremely rare. Thankfully, these days we have a lot of antivenom available to us. In fact, we have multiple antivenom labs um, here in the state of Florida, including right here in Volusia County. So usually less than 10 deaths per year. I will tell you, you still don't want to get bit because of the fact that it's it's a very painful process if the antivenom works. Um, the victims, this is my favorite part of this entire talk. The victims of venomous snake bites are generally males ranging in the age of 17 to 27. If you are not in this age range, you are at a much less risk. Uh, why do you think this might be? Generally speaking, these young gentlemen will not leave snakes alone. Um, this includes my husband. Yep, I thought he was going to get himself killed a couple years ago with a pygmy rattlesnake. Um, this also has hit the news. I'll give you a couple examples just from the last two years. Here in Palatka, Florida, just uh, north of us, northeast of us, there was a young man who was working on an AC unit and came across a rather large diamondback rattlesnake. And rather than trying to get it to move so he could do his job or saying, you know, I've got to come back another day, he decided to play with it. And yes, he got bit in the face. Another example, I was working in Camp Blanding several years ago and they had a uh, unit in there doing some training we got calls on the radio. Everybody had to stop work and evacuate the premises. They had a, a helicopter come in and life flight this guy out of there. He tried to take a selfie with a water moccasin. I'm not kidding, guys. Leave the snakes alone and you will be just fine. Um, generally, victims that are within this age range often have alcohol or other substances in their system. So they might not be using their best judgment and handling, harassing, or trying to kill a venomous snake is always a bad idea. Another thing, always keep an eye when you're out walking, especially in wooded or brushy areas, in the spring and summer months. During the winter, snakes go dormant for the most part. They don't move much. They don't want to be harassed. They're not feeding. Um, they go almost completely dormant and kind of hibernate. Um, between usually mid to late October and about February, March when it starts to warm up. So right now is prime time for snakes to be moving. This means you're gonna see more snakes killed on the highway. This means that there's gonna be um, more instances. This is when bites are gonna occur. These snakes are out, they're getting the heat. 
from the sunshine, they're eating heavily, and they can be quite cranky at grass. So leave them alone. Um, you can also see that on the statistics here, there's a much, much higher chance of uh, having a fatal issue from lung cancer, a car or motorcycle accident, lightning strike, bee or wasp thing, dog attack, or even a spider bite. So snakes are very low on the list of risks. Some tips to avoid having encounters with venomous snakes. Avoid wetland areas. Avoid the edges of woods or other thick brushy areas. And if you are gonna uh, go into those type of areas, make sure you stay alert. Again, watch where you're walking. Use a walking stick. Um, myself personally, I've worked in the woods for many, many years. I have a pair of snake bite boots. I've had that same pair of boots since I was about 14 years old. They are very well broken and actually they're one of my very favorite pair of boots, but they come up almost to my knees and they have a canvas outer protection that is meant to repel um, the fangs from a venomous snake. So thankfully I've never had to test them out, but um, snake bites are not inexpensive, but most of them are very high quality and will last a long time. And once broken in, they're usually very comfortable. So if you're big into hiking, um, I highly recommend looking into that. Um, if you're a working professional and you're concerned about venomous snakes, they also have chaps that are made of the same material as the snake bite boots are. And generally speaking, any type of heavier material, so whether it be leather gloves, um, heavy boots or jeans, if you were to encounter a venomous snake, all that will give you some protection. But they do have materials out there that will actually prevent the snake from being able to impale um, those fabrics. So um, keep the grass mowed. So if you're just a homeowner that's worried about snakes and you have concerns or fears, keeping your grass mowed, keeping brush piles removed, um, wearing leather gloves, and again, using a stick, whether it be a walking stick or the end of a rake or a shovel to kind of knock the bushes around a little bit before you go in there. Um, again, snakes don't like that heavy vibration. They know we're not a prey to them, and so they will go on. You can also try to erect barriers to exclude snakes. So um, fences, such as the one shown in this picture, are pretty effective because most of them cannot burrow under that. However, I will tell you, general fences will not keep snakes out. And I have had a call in Marion County last year from a client that lived in an HOA that wanted to know why her HOA let them into their gated community. Sorry guys, that is a true story. Snakes are not gonna stay out of general barriers, um, but if you have a thick fence or a solid fence, it's much more difficult for them to come in. So, but a general regular fence, most of them will climb right through it if it's on their path. Remember the reasons why snakes are traveling. Just like most other animals, they're traveling looking for food sources, they're traveling to look for habitat, they're traveling to look for water and shelter, okay? They're not coming out looking for you. They're looking for those things that are um, essential to their survival. If you happen to be concerned about snake bites, make sure, again, the very first thing you do is call 911. You want to get prompt medical care. You want to get the victim away from the snake. You also want to keep the bitten extremity lower than the victim's heart. Wash the bite with soap and water. However, do not seek calling nine or do not delay calling 911 first. You do want to wash with soap and water with any type of insect or animal bite because the bacterial infections can be as bad, if not worse, than the venom. So, um, but again, call 911 first if you've been bitten by a venomous snake. You want to try to reassure the victim. Keep them warm and comfortable. Remove any jewelry or restrictive clothing. Otherwise, they've got to find a way to try to get those cut off when the swelling occurs. And if you've been bitten by a venomous snake, you are going to have significant swelling. So, um, the most important thing is, again, make sure you call 911. What you don't want to do, don't wait to see if you're gonna be okay. You need to call and get medical attention immediately. 
please, again, do not try to capture or kill the snake to ensure identification. These medical personnel are trained. They can handle that. They can generally determine what type of snake it was and what type of, um, how large the snake was by the bite and by looking at characteristics that you um, tell them. Don't handle a venomous snake. I will tell you, this is how my husband almost got bitten a couple years ago. Um, he found a pygmy rattlesnake dead in the road and he wanted to get the hide off of it. Snakes have a reflex that is keeps their muscles moving for several hours after they're dead. Also, you may think they're dead and they may not always be dead. So please don't handle dead or venomous snakes. They are just as dangerous, if not more dangerous than a live snake. Um, don't apply tourniquets and don't apply heat or ice to the bite. Please don't try to suck the venom out. Do not cut anybody. Do not make incisions. Um, that is an old wives tale that does not work. So please don't try to suck any venom out after a snake bite. So the take home messages, only six of 40, Florida's 45 species are venomous. And only four of these venomous um, animals are found in Central and South Florida. Venomous species can be easily identified with a little bit of practice. You are welcome to send me pictures of live snakes to help identify them. I do not appreciate getting pictures of dead snakes because once they're dead, what difference does it make? Snakes are not generally found in large groups. So usually you're running across an individual that was just traveling trying to find either food, water, or habitat. Please leave snakes alone and let them do their job in our Florida ecosystem. And all venomous, or all snakes, venomous and non-venomous, should be treated with respect. There's no need to fear them, just pay attention to your surroundings. If you do get bitten, please call 911 immediately and continue to research Florida's fascinating snakes. We have wonderful snake species here in Florida. In fact, if you haven't checked out the Florida Museum of Natural History page on snakes, it is fantastic. They have so much information on each one of these snakes. They've got lots of pictures and they will try to help you identify them from the pictures that they have on their website. But again, you're welcome to send me pictures by email or Facebook Messenger as well if you need help identifying them. Snakes are really fantastic in our environment and are not something that you should have big concerns about. I know some people are very fearful and I have gotten some very interesting calls over the years as an extension agent trying to help people identify them. So um, I did have someone ask a question regarding getting a copy of the slides. Uh, yes, absolutely. Let me give you my email here and I can email them to you directly. And other than that, I am happy to take questions if you guys have any. So I appreciate your time today. I hope that you learned a little bit. If you have questions about specific species, uh, please let me know. And again, don't hesitate to send me pictures if you get encounter snakes in the future. Um, I really enjoy looking at all the pictures that we receive and helping people identify them. We also have several specialists here at the University of Florida in the Wildlife Ecology and Conservation uh, Program. So um, that includes Dr. Steve Johnson. So he has been fantastic to work with. He's come down and done some presentations for us with the Master Gardeners. Um, also, when we recover from this pandemic, if you guys have public groups that you'd like me to come talk to you about, I'd be happy to do that. This is, again, one of my very favorite topics. All right, anybody have questions? I have a couple comments. Sure. Uh, one is that um, I have a couple black racers in the yard, which I love, but the babies do not look black. They look very different, so people might not know that. Correct. And, and also they lay their eggs in, in the ground, so you might find the eggs when you're weeding or something. Yep, thank you for that, Pat. Yeah, that's a fantastic set of comments. So black racers, are very common in our area. They're fantastic to have around your landscape. They um, don't look the same. They are not black when they're younger. They're um, Pat, have you seen one of them recently, the babies? Yeah, they kind of, at, at first glance, they kind of look like a copperhead, but um, obviously they're not. Um, 
I have some pictures somewhere, but not handy. Yeah, I don't have one pulled up right now either. So if you have any questions or concerns about this, again, you're welcome to email me. Um, but yes, that is a great point that um, the black racer is one that does not look the same as the adult version. And they do like to nest in uh, brushy habitats and especially in grassy areas like some of our ornamental grasses. So, um, and they will lay their eggs in that area. So thank you for that. Anybody and, else? And another, one yep. other comment, um, when I'm digging in the ground, planting something, I have little tiny snakes. I think they're glass snakes. Oh, okay. But they look like a long worm. Yep. Is that a glass snake, I guess? There are multiple species that could fit that description and glass snakes is definitely one of them. Um, if you want to take pictures of them, I'd be happy to try to help complete the ID, or you could check out the Museum of Natural History's website. Both are fantastic uh, ways to get that ID. Okay. You know, but yeah, we've got several. We've got ring neck snakes. We've got the glass snake. Um, there's, there's a variety of different species that could fall under those categories. Awesome. Max? Yes, sir. Pygmy rattlers. But pygmy uh, rattlers, okay. Uh, a couple of, well, my, about 20 years ago, a friend of mine told me that the sliding glass door, a pygmy rattler somehow got into the top of the side, sliding glass door. When they moved the door to open it or close it, it fell down. Oh, my. And then I thought, well, well okay, if you say so. I didn't think they had that ability. But back about a year ago, one of our neighbors up here, on his shed, he has a window. And he was uh -huh. out cleaning stuff out around the shed, and a pygmy rattler was up on the top of the window. Do they wow. have the ability to do that? Um, well, from those stories, it sounds like you do. Um, I have not heard of that from a pygmy rattler. I have heard stories like that with rat snakes and um, some of our other climbing species. So I have not heard of that with a pygmy rattler, though. Okay, well, you know, they weren't familiar, so they thought it was a pygmy rattler. I don't know, but it was just something that they had dropped out. The other thing, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Hall, who's one of our master gardeners, got bit by a cottonmouth. Yeah, uh, he got bit by cottonmouth or copperhead? Cottonmouth. Oh, okay. I thought it was a copperhead for some reason. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he so, has a blueberry farm, and he got bit in his blueberry um, patch, didn't he? Yeah, he was cleaning it out. He's, mm -hmm. you know, he's got like 30 acres there, and he was cleaning it out. And he's a native, you know. I mean, he was born and raised here with his family. Yeah. But I guess the point is, it took seven injections of anti venom. Yes. To take care of that, but now that the you know that he's alive and everything, he's still suffering mm -hmm. after effects from yes. that bite. So it's not something that <clears throat> anti venom is going to. It's going to keep you alive, but you still may be you know, suffering the effects. Yes, no, I would totally agree. Um, I actually had my husband was bit by a black widow four years ago now, five years ago, and he still has effects from that as well. So yes, the venom may be um, not in a deadly fashion to you anymore, but you will definitely still encounter issues with it from time to time. Yeah. So. That's a great point. The only thing I can say back to the point on your um, um, pygmy rattlesnake is again, the pygmy rattlesnake does have a um, copper color on its back that might be kind of similar to a rat snake. So I can't say for sure without seeing a picture, but there is a possibility that it would be um, mistakenly identified. So I have heard of multiple people that have had uh, different types of rat snakes that have fallen off of doors or windows, and literally that would just about give you a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Any other questions, guys? Nope. Very good. Enjoyed it. Oh, and when you do your count of how many people are observing, Kathy, on all the presentations that you've given so far, has been quietly sitting on the side here watching. So you can awesome. add one. I get to add one. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs>
All right, guys. Well, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me an email or reach out to the office. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody soon. Thanks for tuning in today. Have a great day. Yep, you too. Same to you. Thank Bye. you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.